Hello, my name is Roger Doudna, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome Caroline Mace. What do you see as being the primary focus of your work? Well, you originally were described as a medical intuitive. Does that still sit no. comfortably with you? No, 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 no. I, you know, my um, occupation, my calling as a medical intuitive, actually was the door that led me to uh, into the world of human nature, the study of human nature and the human anatomy system, um, into the world of the, the, the magnificence of the knowledge of the invisible world, what I would now call um, the mystical ecology system, because that's truly what I study now. And, and in a sense, Roger, I've arrived at a place where and, and this really is the next workshop I'm doing here, really. But it is the mystical ecological system where I finally, all my years, one thing has led to another. The study of medical intuition eventually led to my wondering why people don't heal. Mm -hmm. uh, which was more interesting to me than why people heal. But then I wondered how... What is the essence of healing? Um, that opened up the, the domain of the study of um, consciousness in, in, from the perspective of um, not do we choose to heal, but from the other, which is the nature of what power, what authority we actually do have with ourselves and uh, the choices we actually do make uh, um, and how we misunderstand ourselves and the depth to which uh, uh, what the power of our choice. From there, I then went into the study of our archetypal patterns, the power of what we believe that we don't even realize we believe, the power of our superstitions, our myths, our, our relationship to God, and the fact that most people have more faith in what they don't believe than what they do believe. I'm not sure if I follow that. Uh, most people are these days in our community of people, which are the seekers, the searchers, the people who live within the inner self. Mm -hmm. That inner self is not quite the ego and not quite the soul. It's the passage self. It's an anomaly. It's a hybrid of our time. That inner self was not a functioning part of the psyche before World War II. It is a hybrid that has been developed. It has emerged since then. And that inner self is a product of our looking within ourselves for the search of, you know, am I wounded? The search of developing individuation. I don't know many people who go around asking themselves, am I wounded? Oh, yes. Oh, indeed, right. the people who follow you? <laughs> no, 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 no. People who are looking to find themselves, the first place they start, want, Roger, is, you know, in healing. Well, I, I agree that, that the people who start on the path, shall we say, the spiritual path, oftentimes have to feel like they have to revisit their own past. Right. To somehow or other uh, clean it up or become aware of the operative dynamics or whatever. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And once they get on the path of, you know, who am I? And what the, the identification with their wounded self and the power that that gives them to be not their full strength, but the street currency of their weaker self. The power to almost be whole, but not quite. The power to not quite be their full self. You mean they aspire to becoming their full self, but somehow or other block themselves. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it, but, but it's, the themselves? it's the deliberate blocking and the support to be blocked. The support to be in the... the it looks like the support to be in a support system. So it looks like healing, it smells like healing, it walks like healing, but it's not. It's in fact finding the comfort zone for the inner self. And the conversations for, for that go like this. 
um, my inner self is telling me that I should do this. My inner self is telling me this. And the inner self is a part of, of what a person develops in which they find it easier to express what they're feeling versus just say what they feel. So the inner self becomes their voice of truth versus saying the truth. And we've become people who don't speak the truth very easily. So truth has become a foreign object in our society, in our politics, in the way we live in the United States. It's now a profession to help people speak the truth. It's called a marriage counselor. If you expose the truth in a business, we now have an archetype for that. It's called the whistleblower. And if you do that, you're arrested. Mm -hmm. To speak the truth is um, a very difficult thing to do. The inner self is the voice for people where they will say, but I'm my inner. I'm in conflict with what I say in the outer. But if someone says my inner self is telling me I have to do this, everybody backs off because they think, well, that's more authentic because it looks like guidance. It kind of walks like guidance. The last section that you asked me, where am I going? I finally arrived in the world of spiritual direction because that is exactly mystical ecology that takes in consideration that um, the divine for me is an organic force, not a religious one. It operates within our biology as well as the ecology, as well as our spirituality. It's all one organic system. And you have to for find kind of an organic har harmony. Guidance is real, but it's not a mental property. How do we recognize whether it's guidance or whether it's just based on the next impulse? This now comes from all my years of studying health. You, the, the body itself is designed to, to transmit guidance, organic, intuitive guidance. That is one level of it. That, the question you ask has an answer that's like a layer cake. Mm -hmm. So guidance is an ongoing system that works in multiple ways. One is it works biologically and organically to keep you healthy. So you have health guidance and you know when you're doing something to violate your health because the operative word in guidance is balance. It will always work to keep you in balance. Secondly, it works through conscience. And that's not a word anyone uses anymore. Conscience. Conscience. It will work to balance you between the forces of right and wrong, good and evil, guilt and non-guilt. What you say and what does this need to be said and is that the way to say it? Does this contribute harm or not to this situation? Do, do, are you gonna, why do you have to hurt this person? It, it is always that active principle. So guidance is not, the reason people don't hear guidance is not because it's not available, it's because they're so narcissistic. And they're not working with guidance in the way, guidance is not about serving you, it's about serving others. As in the, the role of working with yourself, They've turned the mirror so much on themselves that they don't get that guidance is about service to all. If you study the great masters, you see it right in front. It's, it, it works in plain sight. Nature is about serving you. You serve nature, it serves you. You violate nature and it'll die. You know, not to punish you, but that's just the effect of your choices. You know, this is, my whole next workshop is God and guts. It's you know, do you, and the guts refers to your biology as re, and your intuition and your courage to get out of a narcissistic state of mind, and actually understand the nature of spirituality is not and it never has been the search for stuff, but the search for truth. So, will you speak about the narcissistic um, aspect of ourselves? That, that would be defined as simply excessive self-absorption, excessive 
inward? Well, you know, the the spiritual path kind of took a turn into the same as healing, into the same as finding my highest potential, a a cross between pleasure and occupation and self-indulgence and and filling in the blanks of where I've been humiliated. If you ask people in my world, and that's thousands and thousands and thousands of people now, what they think their highest potential is, they'll see it as filling in the blank from where they've been humiliated, how they can be recognized, what occupation that fits in the glamour buzz. They never think it's service. Well, you gave um, a very interesting TED talk here last night. Which the thrust of which I took to be um, the importance, basically, of of the primary virtues of just being honest with yourself and um, and uh, taking care of well, honor, honoring your your core belief systems in some sense. Would that be a fair summary? It 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 is um, honoring core belief systems. First, you have to know them and mm-hmm. honor them, and actually have the courage to know to to articulate them, Roger. Do you know, I asked a group of people one time, what the first time, I should say, what are your core beliefs, your actual core beliefs that you would put down and commit to? And interestingly enough, they sat there and went, hmm, hmm. Hmm. And I, and I didn't say even beliefs. I said core values. What do you value at your core? What do you actually say, this is who I am and these don't get negotiated? And then the first one to speak up said convenience. Mm -hmm. Convenience as a core value. I I, I was shocked but not surprised. Convenience was a core value that could not be negotiated. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) This is where we are. Everything has to be convenient for me. The pursuit of the rational mind is a dangerous thing. The divine is not a rational force. We're so in love with the intellect. Miracles are not intellectual. Healing is not intellectual. The mind cannot help you heal. It is not your ally. It is your adversary when it comes to healing. Your adversary. How so? Because it'll trick you. It's a trickster. Can you give me an example? Well, you're an addict, for example, and you need to heal. And, or, and your mind will say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Come on, you'll do it tomorrow. You'll start tomorrow. There you go. You're a procrastinator. You're obese. And, and, you're, and you know you have to give up sugar. You know you have to do this. And your mind says, ah. I'm not okay. so sure that's mind. I'm so sure that's more like habit. See? Here you go. Addiction. Playing games right here. Right here. This very tennis game with the mind. Always the argumentative. <laughs> Always taking the curmudgeon point of view. Right there, Roger. But that's not, that's not rationality you're talking but, about. I mean, it's irrationality. Right. This is the philosopher in you. This is you as a thinker and, and the philosopher. Always going to, I'm not sure, I think I'll question that. No. No, Roger. It's exactly that part. And I, you and I can go at it. We have for three decades. But at the end of the day, you have to say, that part of me, the questioning, the going at it, the I'm not sure, that's exactly the part I'm talking about. Because it can pick apart everything. And that's one at the point where you say, I've got to stop this picking apart. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm diminishing every argument because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You've got to get to the point where you say, this is what I always do. And the fact is I'm sick. And I'm sick because I always do this. I pick apart everything and I don't want to get to the point where I realize I'm scared and I can't pick apart fear. There is a truth in here I don't want to look at. And I will pick at it and pick at it and deny it and deny it and I've got to get to something deeper. Mm-hmm. That I can't pick apart and say this is, this is the core truth. And the, and the mind does not let us do that. And then you have to say, and it's my mind. I have to, why do I do that? Because I don't want to look at what's the truth. The truth is, this is, it could be anything. This is the truth. I'm, 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 lo- I'm, not, this is, I'm not speaking about you, but it could be anyone. The truth is, I am an angry person, or I am this, or I attack people. I see so often where people will be 
I'm working on forgiveness. I'm working on, but I was, and I'll say to them, no, the truth is you're vengeful. You're vengeful. And you don't want to forgive that person. You dwell in the, the ways that you want to hurt that person. And you can rationalize all you want, but they hurt me. This, but the truth is, you image how to get even in hurting that person and what you will do when that moment comes. Mm -hmm. You're saying there's a kind of attitude which leads to illness, heal, run for sickness, whatever. Not quite that simply. Believe me, it's much more complex. In its complexity is its simplicity, believe it or not. But no, no illness is as simple as one thing. But if you understand it's not as simple as one thing, that's the simplicity. Well, I certainly agree that uh, the, uh, we, we have a unique capacity, shall we say, to do ourselves in. However, Finthorn is hopefully not about that. Right, we gotta get back. <laughs> so we have gone, we've gone around the bend here. So this is what my participation in the Finthorn Fellows is. Yeah. And my love of Finthorn coming here and teaching. Yeah, well, um, you've been doing it for many years and we're very lovely. It's very great to see you whenever you come. Um, the theme of this series uh, is love in action, a phrase which was one of Peter Cabby's favorite phrases, um, in which she said that at Findhorn, work is love in action. Mm -hmm. Is that how you experience your work? Much to my surprise. I, I've, I've never walked into a classroom or I've never done my work and I thought, this is love in action. I don't think that way. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I'm not wired that way. And yet I experience... You haven't spent enough time at Finhorn. Right. <laughs> no. I, don't, I just don't think that way. But, yeah. And yet I experience a tremendous sense of love when I teach. Um, and when I... I mean, even when I'm tired and someone says, you know, you got a minute... I'll take that minute. I will, all, I, I will always take that minute. So you experience your teaching and writing then yeah. as being a kind of... Yeah, and I, and I find what I want to write about is aimed at the heart and soul. I'm not as interested anymore in getting across intellectual ideas as I am trying to get people to understand the the power of their heart and soul. So even without my realizing it, I shifted my target. And I didn't really grasp that until I found that I had become unable to write on certain topics. And then um, and the wording was awful. I'd lost my vocabulary. And I'm a, I'm a wordsmith, you know, and I... And I I thought, well, I can't seem to articulate, what happened here? And I really went into a desert and thought, well, maybe I've written my last book. You know, maybe, and, then, and maybe that's, I have to kind of accommodate that truth. And you discovered heartfulness. Yeah. And I, it, it was uh, an awakening for me personally. Well, just speak to me about heartfulness. What does it mean to you? How I experience that is what I want to help people realize about themselves, about life, about the, the, the truth. And it is a truth that people initiate their own suffering. Um, there's always pain in life, for God's sake. We're going to lose people. We, there are things that happen that truly feel unjust, unfair, that's never going to stop. But suffering is self-imposed. And because um, and, there's stages, and there's only so much suffering a person can endure because it is self-imposed. Because you, you, you will dwell in what you perceive as injustice. You will dwell if you believe it only happens to you. And how much of your suffering is brought about because of pride, because of the way you interpret things, because, you, because you think that person deliberately did something to you. When in fact, if you understood the nature of that person, you would realize 
that that person is the sort who would bite off the head of any snake, who would, you know, uh, say harmful things to anybody, that it had nothing to do with you personally, that the, and, 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 and you don't get that sometimes people leave people because they were called. It had nothing to do with you. You don't get that other people's lives are not bound to you as much as you would want that to be the truth. You, you have to, these days, people's lives are long. And, and we don't know how long we will walk the earth together. Mm. And um, most people can't stop thinking that they are the center of the universe, that they're the sun around which the planets revolve. And so they hold on to a position that is simply flawed from the start. And with that comes great suffering. And they don't see the larger picture of, you know, a lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people are going through um, experiences that are brought about through this evolution of this moment. We're living in a, the greatest period of chaos in the history of civilization. In the history of civilization, Roger. I mean, every system of life is changing simultaneously. The ecological system, the, the banking systems, the political systems, the weaponry systems, the internet system. There isn't one system of life that isn't in turmoil or isn't being rebooted or recreated. We're the first generations ever in the history of humanity that have no idea if we're going to survive. We're the first generations in the history of humanity that have the weaponry to destroy the whole place. And we've almost accommodated that truth, that fear, that incredibleness. That, and we live under the myth of Prometheus who stole the fire from heaven, who sent down the Pandora's box, which is our insanity. And from the time we discovered nuclear fire, the history of the world could be rewritten by who has the fire. Is it Pakistan? Is it Korea? Now it's all about Korea. Who's, what are they going to do with the fire? Are terrorists going to get the fire? Everything is about the new fire. And if they get it, what are they going to do? What are they going to do with the fire? Everything. And, and, and that insanity of will we actually make it has altered in an unconscious way how we do, how we work with longevity, how we build we no longer build buildings to last a long time. We no longer have commitments to last a long time. We've reshifted ourselves completely in terms of how we think. Everything has been readjusted because we may not last a long time. New principles of light have poured down upon us for half a century. You either live by those now or you will be one of the people who will be aggressive and hostile and frightened. Because now is the choice point. Either you live by what you say you believe or go and get a gun. Caroline Mays, thank you very much. You got it.